Hello and welcome to the new episode of Spookier Times, a podcast of horror, weird fiction, and gothic across media. I am your host, Robert J. Gannon, and today's subject is something that's a little in the media right now. It's something new and contemporary in some ways. If you're familiar with the Netflix series The Haunting of Hill House, the second season, Bly Manor, came out just in time for Halloween. And Bly Manor is inspired by Henry James' The Turn of the Screw. This is a novella from the 1890s that has that standard gothic, okay, I have a true story for you, and I can't reveal how I got my sources, but... They're real, and I have the papers right here to prove it, set up for the story. And it's a whole lot of nothing, but it will point out, technically, The Turn of the Screw is a Christmas story because it is meant as a Christmas ghost story because a bunch of people are telling ghost stories at Christmas. He's like, I can't tell you this one is too upsetting, but believe me, when I share it with you, you're going to believe me and understand why, 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 why I couldn't do it sooner. The main story, because that's usually skipped over, this isn't Bride of Frankenstein where we get to talk about the epistolary elements of the novel. No. The main story is a governess takes on a job to take care of a young girl. The mother has passed away. Father's not in the picture. She lives in this beautiful palatial mansion with her housekeeper and a riding instructor and a gardener only. The riding instructor's gone, the gardener's only there some of the time, and the housekeeper is hiding something. In the middle of the night, the older brother shows up from boarding school. He has been thrown out for something incredibly upsetting. And the governess is trying to piece together why anyone would leave this job when she starts to be terrorized by both the children and visions of things that shouldn't be there throughout the house. It is a gothic story. A young woman gets a house. There's no romance for her, though, so it's not fully gothic. And it's a ghost story, but it's a ghost story playing with gothic tropes. It's kind of a weird... Henry James wrote weird fiction. I think that's a safe way to put it. I love the novella. Is it a little slow? Yes, that's gothic literature of the 1890s for you. But the story is really good. Do I think Netflix did a good job by it? No. Not at all. And I don't actually like The Haunting of Hill House as a series because they murdered poor Shirley Jackson's book in the first season and now they've come back for revenge against Henry James for no reason. Somebody stop them. They're monsters. But there is another adaptation that came out this year, also in the more contemporary setting, that I think is magnificent. And not everyone agrees with me. Huh. Strange how that happens with horror all the time, especially gothic horror, especially feminist horror. Especially horror that isn't necessarily designed for the straight, white, male gaze. Curious. I'm talking, of course, about writer-director Floria Sigismondi's The Turning. This film came out at the end of January, beginning of February, depending on the market you're in. And it was an adaptation of The Turn to Screw set in the 90s. Specifically shortly after Kurt Cobain died by suicide. The young woman is a college student who's like, yeah, let me try this out. This will be fun. And she goes to be, you know, the tutor, the nanny for this sweet little girl in this really beautiful mansion. And the housekeeper doesn't like her straight away. Does not think she's going to follow the rules. So she's cool and she's edgy and she's alternative and kind of goth and kind of punk. And then the older brother shows up from boarding school in the middle of the night because he had beaten a student unconscious. And no one in the house wants to believe it happened. Because you do not break the rules of order in The Turning. The Turning is more gothic than the actual text, so it's not 100% accurate. But the tone is so spot on. Sigismondi made her name as a music video director for acts like Marilyn Manson in the 90s. She did Beautiful People and a whole bunch of other people's videos, she has this incredible eye for detail in creating these immersive and disturbing worlds around her. And this is no different. There's a new plot element added to the turning that's really spectacular. The young woman had to put her mother into a nursing home 
because she went into early Alzheimer's or early onset dementia. It's not specified which, but she's not really cognizant of what's happening in the world anymore. And her mother spends all of her spare time in this abandoned pool in the facility, fully drained out, just painting all these images and portraits and drawings. And this kind of acts as like the warning part of the epistolary Gothic novel, the I'm going to tell you something that's going to happen and you're not going to believe me, but I had the proof to prove it's going to happen because the paintings are prophetic. But anyway, there's this beautiful underwater set where she's reaching out for help from her mother who cannot help her or really describe what's happening, but it's all hidden in plain sight. You know what else has that element just on its own as a narrative? The turn of the screw. The role of the ghost of the previous governess who's trying to teach the new governess what happened to her and warn her so she doesn't face the same fate is driven by water and the image of the lake and a figure emerging from the lake and the children being drawn to the lake and the pool and the woman coming out of the lake and the children seeing her but not wanting to admit it and everyone being drawn to water and the destruction of the water and the power of the water and the water as a metaphor for life and death. So that's one layer of Sigismondi's interpretation. She also has this beautiful wallpaper all throughout the house that as the governess starts to question if she's actually seeing what she's seeing, begins to transform. It starts this beautiful late spring, early summer image with flowers and beautiful leaves and animals all over the place and slowly begins to decay and fall apart into browns and reds and oranges like the fall and eventually the animals are gone, the nests are empty, the trees are barren, everything is dead at the climax of the story on the wallpaper and no one believes her that anything's going on because nothing like that could actually happen, right? The brilliance of Floria Sigismondi's adaptation of The Turn of the Screw is not the narrative. It is a very loose psychological horror film. It's about cycles. It's about dream versus reality, perception of reality, whether or not we can believe what we see. No, no, no. The genius is the style and the artistry and capturing the tone and imagery of the Gothic in a modern context. People usually can't do this. I'm trying to think of other films recently that have managed to feel like actual gothic texts without going full on period. Chamwick Poke Stalker? I'm not sure. Crimson Peak is kind of nebulous in this time period. Um, Darren Aronofsky's mother hits on some of this stuff but winds up putting too much plot to really be gothic. Like, gothic novels don't got a lot going on. Really, they are an exploration of theme and tone. Like, Mary Shelley, as a teenager, as a bisexual teenager, wrote a novel about a scientist building a beautiful monster, seven feet tall, made of the most perfect limbs imaginable in Frankenstein. And the only thing wrong with him is, there's no life behind his eyes. The lips are a little thin. But he's beautiful and terrifying. And what do you do with that? Henry James wrote, a gothic horror story slash ghost story about are the children evil? Is there a ghost? Can you trust the narrative that we know is true and verified by the framing device but might come from an untrustworthy source, a very emotional and out of place and inexperienced nanny who just might not be used to all the duties a governess is supposed to do? The turning gets us that mindset like no other adaptation of the turn of the screw. At least not contemporary ones. There are some pretty good ones we're going to talk about later. But now, we're switching to something a little bit different. A little piece of media I've created myself. This is one of my favorite pieces I've now updated for 2020 because I forgot I wrote it in 2009. A lot has changed since then, especially in my writing, especially in how we present narratives to the world and what is or isn't okay. And I don't think I crossed any lines, but some of the characters and some of the word choice and some of the language, especially about perception and how people are behaving, doesn't sit right for me in 2020. So, it's not quite turned to the screw, 
But it is one of my old tropes as a writer. A fictional influenced review of another piece of media that I couldn't just take a straightforward approach to and be honest to my feelings about it. This is my review of Bram Stoker's Dracula from 2009. I know the following papers may not make sense at first, but they have been arranged in a very specific order that would begin to make sense as they unfold. 1. From the Journal of Robert, 20th of December, past midnight. I fear I know not what to learn from Bram Stoker's Dracula. Am I to gain an understanding of how even mediocre literature can stand the test of time if the author manages to do one thing well? Is religious allegory worthy of this much praise in an otherwise average late Gothic novel? That can't be it. I'm trapped in a web of interesting images with minimal payoff. The changelings across the street are eyeing up my house for another round of vandalism against excessive Christmas decorations, and I can't say I blame them. But with the constant rapping, tapping, smacking at my front door, how do I dig deeper into a century-plus-old narrative to find the juicy nougat of truth in its fiction? The dawn won't break for hours yet, and this cursed white Ikea light is leaving me with a migraine. I must retire this post and pick it up later when light is on my side. 20th of December, morning. The odd made it through the night without any major destruction. The snow has left Mr. Scrooge hidden from the waist down in a blanket of pristine white, though the cracks are forming in the paint. Too bad a cross won't stop wood from warping. The novel really doesn't move me at all that much in the morning, either. I find it intriguing to revisit the work, since it varies so much from the film adaptations with any merit at all. What director working in the Hollywood idiom would dare reveal that Count Dracula is a vampire, with a seemingly endless series of lusty, undead brides in the first five minutes, as Stoker does in the first ten pages? It would be an act of wanton self-destruction. Perhaps that's the greater lesson here. Don't expose the villain too soon? But it can't be. My favorite element of the novel is the immediate action. It drags here and there in the letters, but is mostly action, action, and more action. It's not summary, it's plot. How astonishing to see even a very plain prose style accomplish what most modern novelists struggle to do. A change of approach might benefit the examination. 2. Digital Correspondence Between Robert and His Brother Other Robert to Brother of Other Robert 9.45 a.m. Gmail My dearest brother, I hope this email finds you well. Thank you for linking me to that website with those international interpretations of fairy tales. It will be most helpful in the upcoming writing project. My purpose for writing is not so cheerful, sadly. I remember you complaining non-stop about reading a novel called Dracula in high school. Perhaps you could help me reconcile my mediocre reaction to one of the most popular novels of the late Gothic period. I fear I'll never quite understand the appeal. Robert. P.S. That action film you want to see on Monday if the snow clears up? You know my car can't safely travel on the road until they plow out the ill-maintained roads in my area. Brother to Robert. Text message. That Boko is stupid, just Wakatha, the movie. Smiley face, smiley face, smiley face. 3. From Something Printed This Way Comes, a blog of Robert. 20th December, post begun, 10.30 p.m., EST. My dearest readers, I fear that I have learned nothing I didn't already know from a reread of Dracula. The shifting narrative technique is novel, it means nothing if the voice never changes between characters. Still, it is an engaging read. It's like a popcorn flick. You don't need your brain to get the message, but you probably enjoy yourself regardless of vapidity. There's plenty of tension and haunting imagery that may be written plain but gets the job done. Maybe there is a lesson in this. Literary fireworks are great, but who gives a damn if they don't amount to anything? Page-turning poplet may not be perceived as the most meritorious, yet it earns more money than serious literature for a good reason. 
It's enjoyable. It's fun. You feel good for finishing a book that isn't that serious. Is a book that great if no one wants to read it? Or the lesson is this. Christ, I really am a lit snob. If it's not complex or very different, I'm probably not going to go crazy over it. That's kind of sad. Hopefully I can force my way through some later books and have an easier time digesting them throughout the rest of the snowy season than I did here. Pleasant dreams. Robert. That was my 2009 review of Bram Stoker's Dracula. As you can see, I have a flourish for the dramatic when I choose to engage fiction with fiction while still maintaining that critical eye, that nonfiction, that understanding of the genres around it. It's actually no longer available. I checked the website it was published on, and they kept my byline, kept the title, and deleted the article. Petty points to them for accuracy. We ain't on the best terms. Moving on, I have some recommendations for you of what you can watch if you are interested in the turn of the screw. First is the black and white horror film, The Innocence. This is the best cinematic adaptation of The Turn of the Screw. I think Floria Sigismondi has the best contemporary adaptation, meaning not the original time period, and The Innocence has the best accurate representation. It is a ghost story. It is a gothic story. It is a touchstone piece of cinematic horror because the way they handled the sequence with the vision of the governess rising from the water while the children play in front and distract the new governess. And she catches it at the corner of her eye, and it sinks. And the children go after her, and she tries to save them and stop them, and she can't. But then she does. But it's almost as if that vision was warning her to protect the children from her same fate. I get chills thinking about that. When I taught filmmaking at a high school, I used that sequence to explain, this is what horror looks like because there's barely any sound there's barely any movement but the mere suggestion that something could appear and disappear before destruction happens was game changing the second and final recommendation today because you should just read the original novella as well spectacular it's free. Find out Project Gutenberg. Find the free versions on Amazon. If you need a little help, there are plenty of literary guides to it. Audiobooks, all kinds of stuff. Enjoy it. The second and final recommendation is Benjamin Britten's opera, English language opera from the 1950s called The Turn of the Screw. It tells the story in a prologue plus 16 scenes in two acts, and each scene is preceded with this 12-note theme that just gets stranger and stranger as things go on. Like, it seems out of place, but then you start to recognize parts of it. It's not used exactly the same throughout. Really complex musical stuff. The storytelling, it, I'm almost willing to argue it's a musical. It's technically a chamber opera because it is smaller. It's bordering on a musical. If you staged it the right way, it's a musical. And, you know, there are writers who are afraid of making an opera or a musical or an orchestral piece actually scary. Britain's Turn to the Screw is terrifying. Sonically, lyrically, all of that. And I'm pulling up the quote right now. They borrow from a poem from W.B. Yeats called The Second Coming, which I should remember the title of that, but I don't. The ceremony of innocence is drowned. It is such a perfect thematic statement for Henry James' The Turn of the Screw. Ooh, beautiful. That's it for the latest episode of Spookier Times, a podcast of horror, gothic, and weird fiction across media. I am Robert J. Gannon. You can find me on all social media under that name. We're also on coffee, ko-fi.com slash Robert J. Gannon. Our store has launched with most, but not quite all, of the materials for Tick 
a short musical, my adaptation of the Telltale Heart. I'm still transcribing all the sheet music. I want it to go up together, but also be able to be purchased individually. The album's also on Spotify and iTunes and all these different services, including TikTok. You can use my original score as TikTok audio. Use it for your scary videos. Anyway, on coffee, we have daily posts. We have galleries of work in progress and other projects. We have videos. We have the store. I'm also opening commissions where you can ask me, pay me to review film, game, or books in print, in audio format, and in short video. You can pay extra for a YouTube video, and with games, you can pay extra for Twitch. My Twitch actually just relaunched yesterday as of when you're going to be able to see this on the 8th of November. Testing the waters on that again. I feel like I can make it work in my schedule and feel safe doing it. And otherwise, share this, enjoy, and have a good time exploring the turn of the screw in your own way.